how'd you get into Vale Amaya? Transition into Vale was crazy fast when it all happened. But the fact that you're pulling influences from Harry Styles, which is so like taboo to say for some people, right? I, I say, yeah, I don't care, yeah, I don't <laughs> care either. Tell me for it. It's about not caring about the quote unquote rules that certain consumers want to set. I think that's just foolish. Is there a certain song that you just love the most in terms of lyrics that you came up with? Mikasa has a special place to me because... When it comes to Vale Amaya now, will we be hearing some of these influences incorporated into the new record? You know, we definitely did some heavier stuff and I think that it's probably the most cohesive team. Is it private? If you don't want to share it, don't share it. I, ha I don't think I've ever said it publicly. Welcome to episode six of the Metal Bird podcast, and I'm stoked to have an extremely versatile vocalist and a vocalist that helped redefine the sound of one of my favorite metalcore, once deathcore bands, and that is Lucas Magyar from Vale of Maya. Dude, how is it Hello. going? I'm doing very well. How are you? Oh, I'm busy. I'm busy, man. Just lots of things going on behind the scenes and trying to get things ready for my award show with the Metal Burb Awards, which Synthwave Vegan is, uh, I believe, is nominated for single of the year. All right, cool. How, how have things been since uh, Synthwave Vegan? Pretty good. Um, the album is done. We actually just shot a video for another song this past Monday and Tuesday. So I just got back. Um, yesterday from shooting that, we were out working with Black Box Studio out of Las Vegas, which was super awesome. It was a great experience. Nice, nice. Black Box Studio. I, I recognize that name. Who, what other videos have those guys shot for? I'm trying to remember. They've done, um, I believe they did a couple, at least one Iadola video. I do believe. I hope I'm not wrong. We were going through some. Um, and I, I don't know if they did some wolf and bear work too. Um, but I think it's kind of a newer studio. Um, so, but the, everything ran really well. It was very efficient, but yeah, I'm not super versed in their work quite yet. I saw some stuff, uh, when we were there and I actually saw some different, different bands I'd never heard of before that they had worked with. So it was kind of cool. Nice. And also, yeah, it sounds like it's like some of the swan core bands too then, eh? Um, yeah, it seems like it. Yeah, that's cool. Before we talk about Vale Maya, which I really want to know, and I'm sure a lot of the people listening want to know, um, I want to get to know you better because obviously you are a super busy guy. For those that don't know, you're a CEO of a production management company. You also have a whole bunch of other side projects. You have so much on your plate. But before we get into all that, um, I just kind of want to know your background a little bit because... I was a big Vale Amaya fan, Common Man's Collapse. I love that record, right? I used to jam it all the time back in the day. And then I remember, nice. uh, yeah, so good. So Sumerian, you guys posted like uh, some sort of like a skit, like a Breaking Bad skit talking oh, about, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> about like introducing clean vocals and stuff. And um, I remember just hearing Mikasa. I'm like, oh, shit, this sounds wicked. It's like Vale Amaya. Um, I didn't realize clean vocals is what was missing in this band. So I love the new and the old Vale Amaya. Um, but so that's my history about you guys. But I just didn't know who you were. I'm like, oh, where did this guy come from? Um, so I love to know, like, what got how did you get into Vale Amaya? What and like your background in music a little bit more? Cool. Yeah. Um, the transition into Vale was crazy fast when it all happened. Um, I had been writing and performing for quite a while at that point. I think it was like eight years. Um, pop bands, other metal bands, just a couple different types of things that I was doing at the time. And I was working on a prog project that never really got off the ground. I had a, I had a problem finding other people who were just as interested and committed as I was. So it was really kind of just me pulling that thing along for a while. And I had been a vocalist at that point, you know, almost that whole time. I, I was more of an instrumentalist, like my first year or two when I got into music, which was when I was, well, like performing it and, and writing it, which was when I was 15. Um, so I really started to gravitate towards the vocal side. I just really enjoyed the different sounds that I could make. Um, it, vocals 
came more naturally than I think some of the instruments did. And so I just liked it more and more as time went on and got really deep into that while still playing guitar and bass and messing around with drums when I could. But vocals, vocals just kind of took over my life. It became a pretty severe obsession after, you know, a short period doing it. Um, and then, as you know, all of a sudden I'm working a full time job. I'm a grown adult trying to make this all work. And this band that I happen to know of and have seen a couple times, Vale of Maya, loses their vocalist, and I find find out on Facebook. Blah. Um, yeah, via Facebook, I found out, and I was working my full time job at a concrete plant, and I was like, well, I could, you know, at least at the very least, I can find out who the manager is, send him an email, let him know what I've been up to, you know, very briefly, and just see what happens. So that's what I did. I, I Google searched, I literally like Vale of Maya management, found our managers. He's still our current manager. He's a great guy. His name's Derek. Found his email, sent him it. Like, um, I think I just put in the subject line, like Vale of Maya audition request. I think might have been exactly what I put as a subject. A very brief des description who I am, the record that I just had put out, which production wise was dog shit, but I had my vocals all <laughs> over it. So that was good. Um, and then that was it. And I just hit send and didn't actually fully expect anything back. You know, to me, it was just like, whatever, these guys don't know me. They probably have four or five people who they know already who have names lined up to do this, which come to find out they did. Um, but yeah, he, Derek got back to me after a couple days. I had kind of forgotten about it. To be honest, I was back at work. And I get an email and I recognize the name because I had just sent this gentleman an email a couple days before. I'm just like, nah. -uh. <laughs> so he hits me up. He's like, well, here's Mikasa. It was instrumental. No vocals on it. He's like, send it back with your with you on it. You know, write the lyrics, write everything. And I was like, great, because that's that's what I wanted. I wanted control of the vocals anyway. So I'm like, this is this is about as home field advantage as it can get if you just give me an instrumental song and let me. And I didn't. With the singing, I didn't know if they were going that route, but I was going to do it anyway because that's, you know, I sang a lot, obviously. I could do both, so there was no way I wasn't going to throw it in there. But with the way Mikasa sounded, I was like, well, I'm just going to make this like a pop metal song, basically. It seems like it's built around a chorus, so that's yeah. what I went with. Um, so I got the song. That night I wrote all the lyrics uh, after work, basically. I didn't have any rhythms. I didn't have any melodies written to it yet. I just had what I wanted to say. And the next day I went to my friend's house. His name is Mike. And he let me do the audition recording there. So he engineered it for me and then, you know, made it sound relatively decent and sent it in. But the vocals that ended up being Mikasa were the vocals that I had originally sent in, other, other than the fact that we retracked them, you know, a couple weeks later. Um, revised a couple of very minor things, but that was basically what I had sent. And then it just kind of picked up from there. And, you know, a couple of weeks went by and all of a sudden I'm there recording and, you know, running out to Knotfest and back and doing the whole Matriarch record. Holy crap. <laughs> That's wild. It was a wild experience. Yeah, no, it was very nuts. My life changed at a very rapid pace. Um, so I just had no choice but to stay extremely focused and take it all in and just get to work. I mean, there was a mountain of work immediately. And yeah, here we are eight years later. Damn. Yeah. You got to shoot your shot and you did. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is like, okay, that's, it, I find it also wild because I'm wondering what the band thought of the clean vocals because it seems so taboo. It's still taboo today. Deathcore with clean vocals. Right. But um, it seems like I guess they had Mikasa written and yeah, there's like that chorus structure was, I guess they were, they were already kind of trying to change the direction of the band. It seemed like, is that correct? It kind of, you know, I, I can't be in their heads at that time, but it seemed like it. And I sort of catered to it then. Um, cause it didn't make any sense to just scream over that whole song, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree. There's like a de dedicated chorus that just fits perfectly with some clean vocals. Um, and like, I guess the band was totally cool with it. They're like, okay, this is like what we need. Well, I don't know. Um, you know, it gets sent back and I'm not in the discussions. I don't know what's going on. It's not my band, right? Um, I just get 
someone gets back to me. Well, Derek again gets back to me a couple days later, this time via phone call. And he's like, are you serious about this? You know, you're kind of you're kind of looking like you're the number one fit right now. And so I think he was gauging my interest. Like, is this guy for real or is he just happen to be some dude who does this and but isn't serious about it? You know, because there's a lot of phenomenal vocalists who just don't want to pursue a career in music. You know, I know people like that. Um, but I was like, no, this is, you know, I'll give my work notice right now. I was touring for a year while still working at that concrete plant and just putting in leaves of absences. Like I'd come back from a month or two months and I, and the first week I was putting in another leave of absence for another month, you know, coming up in a couple of weeks. And then it got to a point where they were like, you know, about a year down the line, almost exactly. They're like, are you going to keep doing this? I was like, the factory job's asking me this. I'm like, yeah, of course I'm going to keep traveling and performing. They're like, okay. So I reduced my role, I think, down to part-time, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, I come back from a tour, and I have a letter in the mail, and they had let me go because I was, you know, obviously not there half the year. Yeah, were you able to get some severance from that? No, I mean, it was... I I totally respected their decision and I don't think there was much I could do anyway. I just missed four months of work, you know, so it was it was fine. I was it was a little intimidating at first. because I was like, well, I'm really about to just try to pay all my bills via my music career right now. Um, so I was a little tentative to not find another job, but I just decided I was like, I'll give it a couple months, see if I need to find another job. And I didn't have to other than, you know, when the pandemic hit was a little bit of a different story, but for a solid six years and now again, I mean, I'm not doing anything outside of things, music related, teaching lessons and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, it went pretty well. Yeah. So sorry, just to hear that again. So for six years, like it's been your full time gig is music. Well, right when I had joined, let me try to do the quick math. So the first year I was in the band, I was doing both. And so that all the way to 2016. So from 2016 to 2020. So I guess it'd be four years. Uh, I didn't have any other side gigs or anything. Um, and actually, even through like the whole, most of that, at least first half of the pandemic. Yeah, it was a while. And then eventually no touring. So I was like, okay, now I have to get something else, uh, some other regular sort of nine to five style job for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I know the, and the thing is, like, you know, when it comes to metal music, it's so hard to keep up with finances, even making content right make around metal music. Um, a lot of people do YouTube as a side gig. I do it as like a full time job. But damn, with like inflation and everything, I'm like maybe I need to just pick up a little bit of a part time gig. But um, yeah, things have changed a little bit. Yeah. But no, I think that's actually wicked about all the things or different avenues that you kind of took, you know, from going from Vail vale Maya, because now the other thing that and the first time we've talked is because you manage bands with your company here, New Industry Entertainment is what it's called, right? Yeah, uh, we threw the entertainment in there for um, just like the handles and stuff. The company is really just called New Industry. Um, but yeah, that's been, we started that in, I believe it was 2017. And it's grown quite a bit and we're pretty happy with where it's at right now and just still trying to push that forward as much as we can. Nice, what was the reason to start this company? Um, I always wanted to be a business owner, even before I knew what I was going to do. You know, before I got heavy into music, I was an athlete. Um, so I was like, well, you know, I want to pursue a career in, in athletics and it'd be cool to open some sort of business revolving around that. So as soon as I got into music, you know, again, when I was like 15, 16 years old, the goal was obviously to become a professional recording artist and performer, but then to also have businesses alongside that just because it's fun and it helps me understand both aspects of the job. I have to work with business people within the music industry. Um, and it's nice to see it from both ends and get a better understanding for, for why things are done a certain way. And it's just a unique challenge. Yeah. Okay. And speaking of challenges, um, I love business talk, right? So like I majored in business and marketing. That's what I was doing before this. So like, and uh, I want to be a business owner, too. And that's why I did YouTube. I want to be my own boss kind of thing. So um, I'm curious to know, like, what are some of like, the biggest struggles that you've had with, like, maybe marketing these bands? It's hard at the very early stages. Uh, just the capital and the resources aren't really there. So it's a whole lot of DIY stuff. Um, 
and each band needs you to do things a little bit differently based on what their strengths and their weaknesses are. So you're not operating with each band the same way. Um, and it's, I think we knew that going into it. I didn't, I certainly didn't expect each band to operate the same way, but always evolving and finding the ways to help the different artists out, uh, which is a lot of fun. And there's just a lot of good discussions and brainstorming about, you know, how this band needs to strategize and work and then how this other band needs to strategize and work. So as you could likely ima imagine, there's a lot of behind the scenes, just management talks that we have as a company and then a whole lot of meetings and back and forths with the artists that we work with and represent. So that way we're all on the same page and we're all organized and, and working efficiently. Nice. And also speaking of the bands that uh, is on like your roster, just for listeners, I know there's Crooked Royals, um, Red Hand Handed Denial, um, or Red Hand Denial. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong. But Red Handed who, Denial. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, they are Toronto based and Crooked Royals, who is New Zealand based. And both of those artists uh, have, have been with us for several years already. And the relationships have really grown and we're all pretty close and they're all they're all doing really well i'm stoked for them is there anyone else or is it just those two yeah i'm actually going through right now just to <laughs> okay. make sure that uh i don't forget anybody <laughs> but so we have uh we have a couple artists that are in um minnesota minneapolis where i'm based now so we manage an act called ladder math is a good friend of mine Derek sampson uh runs that band and we represent a band called terraform and another band called All That We See. So they're sort of comprised of good friends of ours and um, the, the business relationship seemed to make sense, you know, so we figured why not explore that. Uh, and we have another artist who's a friend of mine out of India. His name is Aberic, but his artist name is Flying Cupid. Um, more of a solo gentleman with, with hired people around him for the live performance. And... Uh, Pretty proggy, can be relatively heavy, um, but he's got a good palette and uh, eclectic style. His song, he does a good job of really differentiating song to song on on what they're doing. Ooh, I'm intrigued. But yeah, then there's a couple other projects that I'm in that are under our management as well. Um, and then we also have a Texas-based band called Chernobyl The Secret. So we've been working with them for a couple of years at this point already, too. Damn, you got a lot more bands than I originally thought. Um, because yeah, the, the team's really the team's solid though too. It's not just me. Um, we kind of have our tasks that we each take care of, so things run really smoothly. So the whole operation is certainly not just on me. That would be exceedingly overwhelming. Um, so I'm very thankful to have a few other partners who I work with regularly and closely who help brainstorm as well. Um, they all have their strengths that they can pitch in on and you know together we just kind of keep the the snowball growing <laughs> just keep pushing it yeah um and some of the bands that you have too like uh crooked royals right they're really like those guys they're big supporters of my channel too but their music yep. is awesome and they just got signed to three dot recordings too so like yep just put out their record uh quarter life daydream with them which is the first record under three dots so that's been very exciting which is badass too, by the way. It's so good. Yeah, I like that album a lot. Counterfeit Slaying, that song's doing really well. Yeah? Yeah. Like uh in that, one, that one ended up being the one. Wow, really? So that uh, yeah. like doing really well on Spotify or Um, I think a little bit of everything. I think the video did. I don't know if the video outperformed the other two, but I actually just spoke with Wayne who runs the label today, and it seems like overall that one uh people really gravitated towards. Nice. I, I actually made a TikTok video of that and it, it did like pretty decently. I think got like 5,000 views or something, which, um, it, yeah, it's not bad, especially for a band that is up and coming. Um, another question that I got about, you know, the this uh, company that you uh, run is, you know, w w instead of like the challenges, what are some of the biggest achievements that you've had with these bands? I think helping bands build their touring uh, history is a big thing for us, and, and we've been able to do that. Um, getting bands in communication and deals with some of these labels to help just get that overall next step of development has been nice. And 
one of the main goals that we had when we picked up, actually the main goal we had when we picked up Crooked Royals was to get them out of New Zealand and into Australia. And now that's finally coming to fruition here in this coming year. So I think for us, getting that band off of that island where they've done very well but, and into Australia is uh, a huge thing for us. I think we're all very proud of. Everyone worked really hard to, to make that happen and it took a while, but now, you know, multiple offers seem to be coming in when we had no offers before. So it changed pretty rapidly and everyone's really excited about it. So that's been a big one for sure. That's awesome. Um, you know, what, what kind of marketing do you do for uh, these bands or marketing that you want to start doing? Well, we don't do the marketing per se. We'll sit down, uh, strategize, figure out what we want to do, whether it's running ad campaigns, um, trying to strategize the touring with releases and whatnot, obviously, as well, because that certainly helps. Um, but it's, again, figuring out the strategy that the band wants to take. And then if we need to help sort of seek out those resources so that way those things can happen, then we can supply those resources. But marketing is a very, very big beast of its own. Um, what, we'll, what we will help do, though, is put together very clean and concise documentation and presentation of what the band has been doing and margins to so that way you can physically look and see the success um whether it be you know comparison or compare i'm sorry comparing early releases and video content to what's happened more recently what those margins of growth have been how you know again the tour history and things of that nature so a lot of behind the scenes work and helping the bands have the cleanest and most professional presentation as possible, not just visually, but also on the business side of things when we're, they're getting pitched and sent out for other opportunities. Gotcha. That's very interesting uh, because I'm well aware of just like the video portion of these things, right? So like, mm -hmm. I think uh, social media is like, well, obviously social media is like the massive advertising place, but like TikTok, right? It's, I, I feel like music videos now don't have to be in two different versions because the regular 1920 by 1080, right, for ma main video screens, but now for mobile, right, 1080 by 1920 because like TikTok yeah. and all this other stuff. Yeah. I, I, I strongly, firmly believe that every band needs to be on TikTok as much as I can't stand that platform. <laughs> I, I hate TikTok, but I have to be on it. So, but I do think like it's the best in terms of bands getting discovered through social media. Just the numbers are crazy. The The licensing is seems to be a lot easier in terms of copyright. Uh, it's a lot more flexible. Um, but yeah, so that's why like I, I put the clip up of uh, Crooked Royals, got 5,000 views. I might do a YouTube short on my end for that and it would get maybe less than 1,000. Or on my okay. personal Instagram, it might get like, I don't know, 1,200. Just TikTok is just yeah. like, it, the numbers are exponential in terms of that so anyway that's just my little like timbit of marketing because i i love this stuff right i was like uh yeah i did digital marketing for a bunch of companies and so um i just kind of use that experience towards what i'm doing here on youtube um but to talk about something else let's talk about you know your music projects because you did say some of them are under uh, your company but you got siphon um, you got like another one. I can't think of the name of it. My bad. But also you got like a hip hop group too. Yeah. And then the other one's the airway. Holy. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. They're all pretty different from each other. What made you want to do so many, uh, different projects? You just, I guess your music is so like varied that you want to try different styles, I guess. Yeah. I've been doing, you know, either those projects to some extent or a version of them for years. I mean, I was writing like hip hop and when I was 20, 19 or 20 and like pop music, I has kind of been a part of my life since I was pretty young. Um, metal was the first thing that I was really into with music because of my dad. That was just his go to. So that's all I knew for a while, you know, and then I just got a little bit older and started discovering things through friends and the Internet. Um, and Back then, MTV was sick, right? So you could sit down on MTV and discover all sorts of stuff. And as a vocalist and as a guitar player, I 
I wasn't going to stay limited to one thing. You know, I play acoustic guitar, so I wasn't just just going to slay metal riffs on an acoustic guitar, right? I needed to play acoustic stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I, I was like, well, I, I have a voice I can put to this. So I think through exploration of listening and, and music consumption, that just furthered my knowledge and understanding on a compositional level. And if I wanted to write a different style song, I certainly wasn't great at it right away. It's like developing that writing skill all over again, just figuring out sort of how this style gels together and whatnot. But it was a, it made a huge, it had a huge impact on my composition and my style of vocals because I had to match my voice to that, right? So I'm not going to sing all this rock and metal style stuff over an acoustic song or over a hip hop or pop beat, you know? So it was just fun for me to always be rotating between things. I do, I'd work on my metal stuff for a couple weeks pretty religiously and I'd, I'd make a lot of progress and I'd be really excited, but I just didn't want to beat that to death. And before I know it, have like eight songs that sounded the same. So, you know, I just think it's kind of how I work. Even throughout the day, I'm always rotating through tasks. So it was the same thing. And I'd be like, all right, well, cool. Let me work on some ac acoustic or, or mellow rock music for a couple weeks here. And just kind of continued like that for uh, still doing it. Nice. What do you have the, the most fun doing then? That's the thing is I just... <laughs> It's just being a musician and being able to write. And, you know, if, if I'm only singing or only doing vocals, I'm going to get bored of it. If I'm only playing guitar or only playing piano or only playing drums, I'm going to get bored of it. So it's just having something that's always going to be there for me. Oh, I don't want to, I don't really feel like playing guitar today, but I'll sing a bunch today. Or I don't feel like singing, I don't play, feel like playing guitar, maybe I'll... I'll write a hip hop beat so I don't have to play an instrument. I don't have to do vocals. You know, it just, it's just always changing. That's amazing. I had no idea about all this. Uh, do you see any like, uh, kind of like long-term goals with some of these side projects? They're all important to me. I just want to keep them going and I'm, I'm not going to stop making that stuff. So what's the point of like, I might as well put it out. I might as well just keep pushing it and just keep testing myself and, to see where it goes and just have fun with it. And a lot of it is the collaborative effort. I really like to have other people there who I'm collaborating and writing with and feeding off of. Um, so it's just a lot of fun for me and I enjoy it and I just can't stop really. Yeah. And I, I got the collaboration thing, especially that works really well to brand yourself on like Instagram too, for sure. If you're uh, inviting other people to collaborate on your, um, on your post. Right. So when mm -hmm. I when it comes to that also, like you do a, a lot of vocal stuff lately on your Instagram. Um, what's, I guess like the reason for that is obviously it kind of like uh, showcases some good like social media posts, but like, do you plan on doing more with like your brand, your personal brand? Yeah, absolutely. I actually uh, reconfigured where I was shooting. Um, same room, but different angle. It's more so it's not this exact angle, but it's shooting into this part of the studio room down here. It just looks a little bit cleaner. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have the resources to create and make that stuff. Uh, I don't think I'll make, you know, a full-time job out of it. I think I like where I'm at, but that just helps keep the engagement there and keep people interested. And I'm doing vocals on a very regular basis anyway. I might as well plug in the mic and turn on a camera. Um, granted, I got to drop video, edit video, you know, make sure the audio, you know, so it, it does create more work. That's why I'm not doing it on a super regular basis. But when I have the time and energy and I can put in the effort to make it look and sound good, I certainly want to just put that stuff out there. So there's something that, you know, people who are interested in, you know, following me can listen to and, and just engage with. Dude, I think that's so, I think that's really awesome because when I was doing YouTube, right, I was just making YouTube videos. I'm like, okay, I just want to be a YouTuber. So I just, you know, put videos out Instagram. I might upload a random photo of me. That's that. But now with again, TikTok, like now it's all about these short bite sized content. Okay. I should probably be on TikTok. So now I'm, I'm putting stuff out on TikTok, but now Instagram is like, wait a second, we need to be like, TikTok. So now they're really pushing hard on reels. So um, I'm sorry if I've been spamming your wall lately with all these uh, reaction videos because that's what you oh, no. that's what you got to do now. It's like, okay, like right. it, it's not if you post like a regular photo, 
it won't do as well engagement as other things that can get uh, shown through the algorithm for the most part, right? So mm-hmm. I think what you're doing like vocally is actually uh, really cool. And, you know, I um, you do like vocal lessons too, right? You were saying that? I might- yep. Yeah, I think very regularly. Yeah, you taught, uh, I think you taught Nick, right? Nocturnal. Yeah, I've worked, I've worked with Nick. Uh, I think we've had three, three different lessons. I just worked with him a couple weeks ago again. I love him. I appreciate that man very much. Oh my so, God. Yeah, he's, uh, he's done so much for the metal scene, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I should probably hit you up to do some vocals too, because, uh, yeah, I, I just play guitar, but I cannot sing or scream for shit, but who knows, maybe? I'm, I'm around. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Like, uh, when we're talking about all these different influences that you have with these projects, when it comes to Vale of Maya now, will we be hearing some of these influences incorporated into the new record? Like maybe some hip hop, perhaps? Um, I think the closest we'll probably get to that is stuff like a song like Outrun, where that pre-chorus and chorus are very much like pop style vocals. I don't know. I don't see us ever actually putting rapping in it. Um, but to me, when I'm working on vocal rhythms what, with like screaming parts, you, I get to do a lot of that stuff. So everything that I'm doing kind of mo- works its way into other stuff, but not always in the way you might assume. Like, oh, well, he's doing, you know, hip hop and rap over here. Maybe he'll he'll rap in Veil. Probably not, but that project, that sound is in there somewhere. You can definitely find it with some of the the way that I phrase things, screaming, the way that I'll build a certain melody when it makes sense. Um, you know, same things with same thing with like the airway and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess like not only vocals, but what what's the different about the writing and recording process this time around? For Vale. Yeah, for Vale. Um. Well, we had. A different team on this record, and I think that it's probably the most cohesive team that we've been a part of, at least since I've been in the band. Um, we work with Zach Jones, who produced, engineered, and uh, I believe helped write as well. Well, definitely helped write. And then KJ Strock, who helped write instrumentally, I believe, um, on a f- couple different songs or a few different songs, and then worked pretty extensively with me on the vocals. So there was pretty good vibes with the group and uh we you know we definitely did some heavier stuff uh than probably even on false idol definitely heavier than matriarch as a whole for sure and i think false idol in my opinion got a little bit heavier and a little darker than matriarch and now we just kind of moved into that direction a little bit more real quick um I didn't think this was going to drain my battery so fast. I'm at 10%. Let me just grab. Oh, it's just go, go. Like, <laughs> it's all good, man. Sorry cool. about that. No worries. What were we talking about? Uh, Vale Maya sounding really sick. New heavy stuff. Yeah, and the new <laughs> record process. And uh, yeah, who we were working with. Nice. Okay. So uh, I guess the direction of the new record, I guess there's going to be obviously heavy stuff. Can we expect anything else? Uh, obviously, there's. The, the pop references and things, um, songs that have, you know, more maybe metalcore vibes as well. Um, but I think overall, I like the composition a lot. And I think we blended it a little bit differently than maybe in the past. So I'm very excited to see how this one's received when it comes out. Man, I, I am so stoked. There's one thing that I've noticed in terms of making reaction content around like all these bands when it comes to Vale of Maya, you know, all of us metal reactors are so hyped. Like, okay, we got to jump on this cause we love this band. And then when we do, it's always like every reactor just loves the song. There might be like the odd video, but I, I don't really see it. Generally everyone just like is stoked. Synthway vegan, same thing. Everyone's just mind blown to that track and outrun too. Um, and like, say like there's another band or something that we all do. There might be a few people who are like, oh, I thought the song was all right, but that's never the case with Vale of Maya. So I'm just saying, I can assume when the new stuff gets released, every one of us are just going to be on board with it, right? Yeah. Vale of Maya is one of the bands that few bands that can do no wrong, really. Even if you introduce hip hop or whatever, I think mo- most people will be stoked with what you guys come up with for the new material to come out 
um, it's looking pretty promising right now, especially the video we just shot. We, we saw some clips today that got sent over and I think it looks better than we even expected. Nice. I, I, dude, I, I'm so stoked for that. Um, and another thing I want to talk about with Vale Maya is that, you know, obviously was a deathcore band. And now since you introducing some pop elements, it's becoming like a metalcore band. Uh, but you guys kind of are like a little bit of a hybrid too, right? Synthwave Vegan is pretty much like a deathcore track. Um, I'm just wondering, what is like the audience perception of it? Because I know there's some people that will die on the hill that the common man's collapse is like peak Veil of Maya, right? Do you still get like a lot of people like that or are most people, majority of people comfortable with Veil of Maya sound at the moment? Yeah, I think a lot of that talk died quite a while ago. I mean, I didn't pay much attention to it from the beginning. Um, but going through things now, and I'm, I don't really care too much about comments online. It's not all that important to me, really. Um, but if I do happen to see things, I'm not really seeing that stuff at all anymore. Nice, yeah. Um, I barely see it, too. And then when I do see it, I just feel like, I don't know, it seems like an outdated opinion to have a little bit. Um, another thing that I like to talk about is like, um, like certain gatekeeping in terms of styles of music. So when it comes to deathcore, you know, you, you can't have clean vocals. No, that's not deathcore. Right. But obviously with a lot of, um, deathcore bands lately, they're all introducing clean vocals in some sort of way. Uh, and I think Vale Maya does that too. But what, how do you feel when it comes to specific genres and sounds? Do you think the same thing that deathcore can include cleans i think a good song is a good song you know put it in my ear and if i am into it i'm not i don't have these rules you know i think innovation is about not caring about the quote unquote rules that certain consumers want to set i think that's just foolish and if every artist did that there'd be a lot of music that that we hear today that simply wouldn't exist so it's hard for me to understand why those types of mentalities are still around, you know, because artists just simply don't care. An artist is going to create what they're going to create and put it out. And even if it gets shit on, I'm not going to be too worried about it. And it's definitely not going to discourage me from taking another risk later on. If I like it, I, it's good. It's going out. <laughs> That's such a good answer, man. I love that. Um, yeah, no, there's so so much gatekeeping, and you're right. It's it's all about innovation and not having limitations. I strongly believe bands or albums that stand the test of time are ones that are a little bit more genre blending, right? Stuff that like sure. it's hard to categorize. Like, what style of music is this? I don't know what it is. Like, it's just a band that's pushing the limitations of what this style of music can be. Um, yeah, yeah. So Otherwise, I gets exhausting on the ears after a while to hear the same thing. Oh, you know, I'm like, what's the point of copying another band that existed 10 years ago? You know, oh, you want to associate that. You want to draw in fans who associate with that. That's cool. But if you're saying so, so strict to these made up rules, you, what are you going to do? You're just going to go try to be the best Chevelle cover band you can be with a different name. You know, I just don't understand the point of that. Yeah, I, I totally 100% agree. Even like, you know, with these like uh, gatekeepers too, it sounds like with the new album, right? You're going back like to really, really heavy stuff or and also the pop stuff. Either side of this, I do firmly believe majority of people just love either side. It could be really heavy or really poppy. You guys just pull off those styles just so, so freaking well. And uh, yeah, I think that's the big reason why um, you guys are still like a successful band today. Like I know a lot of bands that kind of like drift off their sound and then maybe they get less Spotify listeners, but you guys have found a way to continue to evolve, retain what makes the band special, but just add new ideas. And I think that's why like the fans are still like, like loving what's going on and everything. You haven't lost your artistic approach really. Yeah. Um, writing is a lot of fun for me. And I, I always like the challenge that it, sends my way and trying to figure out you know, some songs will sort of write themselves and it seems very easy and obvious of what needs to go there. And then there's the songs where you're beating your head against the wall, trying three, four different things for just about every section of the song before you land on something that you're truly happy with. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, uh, I don't know the mental gymnastics that go into it sort of never stop. You're always trying to solve a new puzzle, but I think that's what makes it fresh and exciting every time. Exactly. Yeah. Um, speaking of like, uh, well not music, but I want to know a little bit more about like touring now. So, um, I'm just curious, like a simple question, like what is some of your favorite tours that you've experienced? It doesn't matter if it's Vale of Maya or some other band that you've had. Uh, I have had several great times touring with DGD. We did a run with them in Australia, toured with them in um, Europe and UK. We've obviously done runs with them in the States. Um, you know, these guys are some of my good friends. They're fun to be around. Shows are always great. Their fans are are always excited to hear something new and different. So those are usually very positive experiences and, and tours to be out on. Yeah, the thing is, like, uh, you always see, like, tour posters, Vail Maya and Dance Gavin Dance. Like, okay, these guys clearly have a great connection. Um, I'm wondering how that, like, initially started. I guess, like, you guys just went on tour together, and then all of a sudden you realize maybe, like, oh, we click. And then also you just said, but the audience is... Um, adapting or they're accepting of like new sounds, right? So I guess that's why uh, touring with Dance Gavin Dance has been always so good. Yeah, because uh, they're not just looking for every band to be the best version of DGD that that other opener could be. You know, you show up and you're heavier or whatever the case might be, but they're just down for it. It seems like you know, show up and put on a good show, and it doesn't seem to matter what you do in terms of style, they're pretty into it. Um, you know, our bands obviously had known of each other, but it wasn't until our management had brought them under their, the management as well. So um, our manager definitely helped cultivate that relationship. That's sweet. Um, I really find the stuff about the, you know, the fans just being so accepting of it really, really cool. Um, I guess since Dance Gavin Dance is such a, interesting sounding band that uh there's no, no one else that really sounds like them that maybe yeah it makes them a little bit more accepting of other bands like i was talking to uh Rody walker from protest the hero like uh, a month ago and they did a tour with uh dragon force and their music is not that different from dragon force at times and they even have a keyboard solo from the dragon force uh keyboardist but when they were touring uh, the, with Dragon Force, they got booed all the time. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, but wow. I know and it's just like it's kind of shocking. Like, like I don't know, they're riffy and they have like power metal elements too. It doesn't seem that different. So it just, I, it seems like some fan bases are just much more particular. So I just found sure. that really cool about Dance Gavin Dance just being like um, really accepting. I guess. Yeah, I think they they have a really open minded fan base. Yeah. Um. Um, speaking of more touring stuff, like, I guess, uh, what are some of the craziest experiences that you had touring? Oh, uh, well, there was the second full tour that I had done with the band where there was just a whole, whole list of things that, that went wrong on that tour. Um, uh, one gentleman got severely injured within the first few days of the tour. Um, he had unfortunately fallen off of the bus while we were driving down the highway and I believe Poland. What? Um, so that was obviously tragic. Luckily we found out the next day that, you know, he was alive and for the most part he was, you know, maybe not very okay in that moment, but I do believe over as the time went on, he, he did make a full recovery from it. And I believe he's back out doing it again. And then it's on that same tour, we got robbed in Paris and stranded out on the streets of, of Paris until like 6 a.m. Holy shit, what year was and, this? Uh, this was in Europe. This was my first European tour. So here I am, just this kid from the Midwest on his second tour ever in Europe, and shit just goes <laughs> crazy. Everything that could have went wrong for sure went wrong. Um, a vocalist of one of the opening bands got left at a gas station, was there for hours before we were able to pick him up because we got a, quite a ways down the road, like a couple hours down the road before we even knew. He had to use like a customer's cell phone at the gas station to call his management or his parents or something. And then they got in touch with our management and then it gets routed to us eventually that, Hey, 
uh, there's a member of the tour that's currently three hours away at a gas station that you guys apparently had stopped at. So it, the whole <laughs> month was chaos. We ended up having to cancel the show after that Paris debacle where we got robbed and stranded out in the streets because we missed bus call by several hours because we didn't have a, a bus. The bus got robbed and it was getting repaired. We didn't know where it was and it finally rolls up, you know, 6 a.m. And so we lost the show that that day. It was a wild experience. Did you get your stuff back? Nope. Um, oh, so we didn't have... Vail didn't have, I don't think, anything taken. We oh. didn't, I would just, I don't know if we didn't have a whole lot of cash from, uh, like, with us or not. Um, but I know some of the bands had, they had found their cash from merch. So we had bands missing envelopes of money. We had laptops, iPads, things like that go missing. Um and then we were just, I, Vail, we had all our stuff. So I had my backpack, all my valuables just happened to be with me just about every day. Um, so we didn't, we weren't leaving important things on the bus, the whole tour, fortunately. So that was just another regular day. And then the bus comes back and things are missing and we just kind of lucked out. Holy. Has a uh, touring been easier since then? <laughs> Touring's never easy, uh, but that was <laughs> that one had the most things go wrong. I think. Damn. Um, I guess with that, like, what do you enjoy more doing? Do you enjoy the writing process and and recording process, or do you enjoy the touring maybe a little bit more? Well, I think the creative process might be a little bit more fun for me. Um, they both are uniquely challenging. And to me, it's just always about, you know, making it up the mountain at the end of the day, whatever the case might be. Um, so I, I do like the challenges that touring poses. Uh, but writing, I would say overall is probably just a little bit more fun, less physically taxing, which makes it a little bit more fun. Yeah. And you don't get robbed. Well, you could, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's fair. Also, speaking of like your uh, writing and recording, you know, I want to know about your lyrics a little bit more. And I'll be honest, when it comes to lyrics, I um, I don't gravitate towards lyrics too much. I'm more of like an instrumental kind of listener. Um, but I still want to know like some of the things that influence you and your writing styles and the topics that you like to cover. Um, maybe certain songs that you personally like the most lyric wise. Um, could you just maybe elaborate on, uh, your lyrics and your style of writing a little bit more? Sure. I can, I have a, a couple different techniques, I suppose that I've leaned into over the years. At first, I think everything to me had to be really genuine and personal. And I'm thankful for that because that's probably my main driving force as a lyricist is personal things, things that I truly genuinely care about. But as time goes on and you're writing more and more and you're writing, especially with different styles of music that are so obscenely different from, from one another, you, you know, I found that, man, I have to cater to this song differently. You know, this just has a vibe that I, I don't have something going on right now that really matches it. So then it's like, all right, well, um, this movie I watched or this book that I read or this current event that I'm aware of seems to fit this vibe. Or maybe I'll just make up a story of my own just to see how interesting I can make it, whatever the case might be. So it's been fun because it certainly changed the way that I approach writing lyrics absolutely over you know the last several years. Fair enough. Um, is there a certain song that you just love the most in terms of lyrics that you came up with? Mikasa has a special place to me because it's written about the current circumstance. Here's a song, audition for this band. So I was like, all right, well, what does this audition mean to me? You know, what is this going to do for me in my life? What's the, uh, you know, to reference a song, what's the opportunity here? What could come of it? So that one was interesting because it was me talking about that current moment and what it meant to me and how I viewed it. Um, and then I think 
Outsider is a bit special to me too. Um, but I didn't, I didn't notice that until after it had come out and it was more so I pulled that from inspiration I had from a movie and tied it to, you know, my interpretation of the movie. And then people seemed to really connect with that one because of, I think when it was released and what was happening at the time. So to be able to, to really help people have something to relate to on a very personal and immediate level was special for me. No way. So what movie is it uh, based off of? Can you do, is it private? If you don't want to share it, don't share it. I I don't think I've ever said it publicly. Oh, you don't have to, man. It's all good. I was just a question. Fuck it. It doesn't really matter. Um, so I pulled the inspiration from Joker. Okay. And I even twisted one of the lines. There's the line in the movie where he says, is it just me or is it getting crazier out there? Yeah. So that's where I got the idea for the line, is it just me or is the whole world suffering? So I kind of rephrased that a bit and threw it in as like the one tiny hint. But yeah, I've never said publicly that. I think I've told people in maybe interviews and things that it's, I reference parts of a movie for it for sure. But I don't think I ever told anyone which movie it was. Well, it's a nice little reward for people who are still listening to this podcast at the moment. For sure. (laughs) (laughs) No, dude, that's so cool. Also, Mikasa, holy crap. I'm thinking about the song in a whole different light, too, because like I said, lyrics. I'll read it. Uh, yep. I'm looking at the lyrics right now. I'm just seeing some of the things you're saying in line. The stones a form a message in the sand. I will never relinquish what lies below. Staring back at a helpless man. It's just, it's so cool. It just, it's a song about that specific moment uh, in time and having context. Now hearing you talk about, you know, how you started with the band. I already love the song. Now I love the song even more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, okay. That, that's really cool, dude. I don't want to take uh, too much of your time up. So. I uh, I ask questions on Patreon. So um, people listening, if you want to ask a question to the next guest on the Metal Burb podcast, go to patreon.com slash Metal But uh, I got two questions here. And uh, one okay. of them is from Daniel Spencer. He says, what non-music influences do you have creatively? Creativity. Definitely movies and books and current events. Those are the, th- the other things that I'll pull, pull from for sure. Yeah, I guess what non music is just so uh can you give us like maybe specific movies or books? Um well so there was you know after after seeing Joker and then hearing the song Outsider, I thought that that was appropriate and I thought that that vibe sort of matched up really well. Um I was inspired by Stranger Things. That show is awesome to me. It's one of my favorite shows, so I've definitely thrown um some references there into a song in the past. I'm um, trying to think of another one offhand. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't think of one of the other ones because I wrote several songs about movies, and I'm just having a tough time connecting some of these other dots at the moment. Don't worry, because that's going to be one of the questions later. Uh, so I'll come back to that to pick your brain a little All bit right. more on that. But uh, okay, we have another question from Blood Mist. Um, let me see how I can rephrase this a little bit better, but. Uh, what can I do to um, see if you can? Okay, I'll just word it how he said it. See if you can learn more about why they scrapped an album they had nearly finished because of someone they worked on it with. That's a tough one. Um, it's a very convoluted situation. Some of the ways that the transferring of files was handled didn't really help the matter. So we were stuck in a very interesting predicament and our options were not great so some things are very internal you know um and that information i don't really expect to ever be put out there uh it was just a interesting time in our careers Damn. and you know i think that overall it'll be worth it but yeah that was a interesting experience for sure okay so maybe some of the ideas that you've had were you able to incorporate into further releases honestly not really um you know some of the songs that we put out came from that album yeah um the outsider being one of them 
viscera being one of them. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of, well, I guess we're starting all over. So lyrically, everything was just a whole new thing. Cool. Okay. Okay. Originally, that's why I had another, that's why I had a problem coming up with other movies is because every song on the original record was rep pulled, the, the inspiration was pulled from either a show or a movie. And I had to think about well, there's only a couple options that actually got put out there. The rest of them don't exist. Really? <laughs> yeah. They were all about some film or some show, and they're all gone now. We don't have those songs to put out. Okay, so when it comes to the song titles, is that you or is that Mark that comes up with the song titles, or both? Uh, it's usually Mark will name a lot of the songs. Sometimes we'll pull it from the lyrics or an idea that I have. Um, but, you know, like on this last record, I think we got we got a lot of feedback from the producers and stuff that we were working with too. Oh, okay. Because like I'm asking cuz like uh you're talking a lot about movies but then I see the song titles I'm like that's very video gamey and we're like sure. that Final Fantasy or that's very like Attack on Titan kind of thing. Um okay, cool. That's all I got for the Patreon questions. But now I'm just going to end the podcast with just like some fun simple questions since we're already talking about it so much. Uh I'd love to know some of your um favorite movies maybe top five favorite movies it doesn't have to be like top five just movies that you really like any order sure um i'm really stoked to go and see the sequel to avatar but the original avatar is definitely a movie that i thoroughly enjoyed as well as interstellar love that movie um then there's the action comedy side of me that wants to list the bad boys because i'm a sucker <laughs> for, uh, action comedy and Bad Boys 1 and 2 were great. I also have not seen the latest one. I'm kind it, of afraid to. I, don't, I didn't like it. I watched like the first 15 minutes and I couldn't get through it. <laughs> yeah, what do you do? 1995. Can I, can I ask how old you are, man? Uh, I'm about to be 32 or, um, kind of early on in this coming year. Damn, I'm older than you. I'm, uh, I'm already 32. <laughs> I'm just I'm just wondering because like I'm looking at Bad Boys came out in 1995 and I barely remember that movie. Um, okay, Interstellar. So you're like Christopher Nolan fan? Uh, it, you know he did a great job on that. I, I'm not one to just follow a, a number of uh, filmmakers and writers. Um, I'm just going to gravitate towards what I see and and what I like. And you know, I, if there happens to be a trend there where I, I like this filmmaker and several of his movies great but that's not always the case for me yeah so i guess you weren't a fan of tenant i've never even seen that oh uh, i didn't care for it so <laughs> <laughs> um okay so interstellar joker uh bad boys is there maybe a different movie um i kind of want to reference th I'm, I'm going through all this the different sports movies because i was like a big athlete when I was younger. So I gravitated towards a lot of uh, football or <laughs> movies about football and whatnot. Like varsity blues was a great oh, movie. A lot. Yeah. Varsity blues was good. I'm not a big, yeah, like, great yeah, I'm not a big like sports movie person, but I remember watching that and thoroughly enjoying it. Um, yeah. That was, that was also a movie that's been, been around for a while. Yeah. It's a uh, 1999. Um, so, okay. This is, yeah. I remember you saying this earlier and I had no idea. So you were an athlete where you like a football player. Yeah. I played baseball for a long time. I played football for a long time. Um, I joined basketball a couple different times. Uh, did a lot of running and yeah, it kept me very occupied when I was in grade school and early on in high school and then music happened and uh, I just, went a different direction after a while do you still play sports on the side um i the extent of my athleticism these days is you know running a mile and a half or so when when the weather i mean it's freezing right now so i haven't ran <laughs> in, a, in a few weeks um and i have my heavy bag which is nice for my cardio as well so that's pretty much it um if if i have some friends interested in playing a pickup game of basketball or something i will but it's been a while since i've hit the court or anything Gotcha. I'm old, man. I said, I'm almost 32 years old. I'll break. Dude, I'm 32. I, I go to the. I've, I've played some basketball and football on tour, though. Um, I've yet to be beaten on tour, so I welcome any other fellow musician athletes out there. 
No way. You can kick uh, most people's asses? Well, mo I think a lot of musicians just, you know, didn't spend half their lives <laughs> as athletes, and I did. So I, you don't, you know, you, you get older, you get slower, but the game's still, it's still there. You still know how to play it for the most part. I probably couldn't pitch a baseball very well these days, um, but I can still catch a football very well, and I can still dribble a basketball and steal it from you and, you know, just good fun for old people who aren't, you know, ever going to be a professional athlete. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's sick. You should have like little competitions with uh, some of the bands that you go on tour and like maybe like even put it on like Instagram or something. Yeah, that would be for sure entertaining because I mean, we'd probably all just embarrass ourselves. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's fun. Um, okay, another question is, uh, you know, I'm going to put this into two different categories here because I want to know about your top three favorite metal bands or what's that? I don't know. It's tough. I've been, I've been, I mean, I've been so far off like metal recently. Well, like maybe bands that you grew up with that you really liked. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I Metallica was like the first band that I probably knew existed. Um, so my dad was definitely spinning Metallica cassettes when we'd be rolling around in the car. Um, as well as Megadeth, uh, he he got me into like Black Sabbath, Rob Zombie, things like that. Nice. Okay. Um, then, what are your non-metal influences that you have, or or bands that you really like? Yeah, that can come from just about anywhere. Anything from Usher to Paramore, Panic of the Disco, or Fall Out Boy. Um, yeah, it's just kind of everywhere. I listen to a lot of top forties when I'm in the car driving, when I'm at home, I don't listen to a ton of music, but sometimes my fiance and I will sit down, you know, later on in the evening with a, a drink or with friends and we'll pull up the 1975 who I've really come to love. I just saw them the other week, nice, um, man. here in Minneapolis. So that was sick. Uh, Louis Capaldi, we get into, um, Harry Styles is another phenomenal artist. He's Halsey. really good. Yeah, that, all those artists are are great. I just like I'm a sucker for big production and awesome vocalists. Man, that, I think that that's so cool to hear. Someone tweeted out the other day saying like metalheads who don't listen to metal but perform metal music are weird, LMA or something. And it was getting a lot of traction, and I retweeted it with a quote saying like I find metalheads who listen to genres outside of metal create the most interesting styles of metal though, and I think that's case in point with you. I, I think like uh, having so much of the pop influences and hearing things outside of metal makes your band more unique because the amount of like metalcore bands out there that clearly listen to all the same bands. And, and so they just sound like copycats of everything else that's going on. But the fact that you're pulling influences from Harry Styles, which is so like taboo to say for some people. Right. I, I say, yeah, I don't care, yeah, I don't <laughs> care either. For it. Dude, I'm the exact same when it comes to my reaction videos too, right? Like I, I'll say anything. Like uh, Polyphia starts right, um, bringing a pop artist for their song ABC. I thought it was fucking amazing. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, the vo yeah, the vocals are cringe. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, not to get heated, but yeah, I think uh, I think that's really cool about all these other non-metal influences that you have. Um, all right, another one I got is just a uh, top three favorite foods. Dude, Thai food. Yeah? Definitely. Um, yeah, big fan of pad thai and red curry, green curry, peanut curry. Stuff's so good. Uh, <laughs> I, I hinder myself over it. Um, Can you uh, also, Japanese food, sushi and ramen. Love it. And then I'm going to have to go with... My third is a tough one. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I'll I'll put Mexican in there. Oh hell yeah! Mexican food is awesome. Hell yeah! Tacos, enchiladas, all good. I'm half Mexican, so that makes me happy right there. Yeah, dude, great food. Yeah, a uh, lot of obviously things not not created and you know burgers are cool and stuff, but uh, I've had so many burgers and vegetarian burgers in the years that I'd much rather grab you know some Asian cuisine or something like that. Yeah, and um, sweet uh, vegetarian burgers. Are you vegetarian or vegan? I eat a little bit of everything, um, but mostly plant based stuff. Yeah, you know, I'm a. I like the impossible stuff. If I'm trying to, you know, have a burger style thing that's not not actually meat, um, I grab the impossible sandwiches from Starbucks quite often. 
I never had that before. Oh, dude, it's so good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't even tell the difference. Yeah, honestly, I don't. I don't care. I just eat whatever. I eat whatever's like cheap, really. <laughs> so like uh, <laughs> at Costco, right? They had these uh, veggie hot dogs that were like, you know, they were going for pretty cheap. Bought them in bulk. I'm like, oh hell yeah, these are like the protein is so high, the fat is so low. It's like crazy healthy. Oh my god, it's like eating cardboard. It was just absolute. Some garbage. of them are not great. Some of the meat supplements, um, you know, they didn't exactly crush it on. But I would say that there are a lot of great ones out there. And once you know what they are and what you're looking for, there's so many phenomenal vegetarian and vegan dishes. It's just insane. I almost prefer that food. In fact, I do prefer that food uh, because I feel I always feel better after it. But I feel like the flavors, you're not like relying on this greasy meat texture, you know, so I think the flavors you get out of them a lot of times are better. Like, like I would I would just get to take tofu and vegetable pad thai over chicken pad thai every single time. I would never put chicken in my pad thai anymore. Awesome. Same things with like curries, like I don't, don't want the meat in it because I don't like it as much. I just want the extra vegetables, like throw more broccoli or something in it. Damn, that that's actually a good point because, yeah, I think uh, the protein can take away a lot of the taste from other things too, right? So with these veggie options, yeah, you're probably getting more flavors from everything else. Um, Can you handle spicy food? I love spicy food. The yeah. problem is... It doesn't love me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I absolutely love it. Well, you were saying Thai and Mexican food, so I'm like, okay, yeah. you must be able to handle some spice then. Yeah, and I always like it just beyond what's comfortable because otherwise I feel like I didn't get enough spice. So it's always got to hurt me a little bit, um, and I'm always paying for it. But, uh, dude, I just I can't stop. Yeah. Sriracha all day. <laughs> Sriracha. Uh, Frank's Red Hot is, I, I think it's garbage, but just, yeah, I, I, it's good on some things and same with like that Tabasco. I find certain dishes are better with certain hot sauces. Like I would never put Sriracha in my ramen. I want the actual chili paste, but I'll put, I'll put Sriracha all over my avocado toast. No problem. Ooh, you're making me hungry, man. <laughs> uh, it's not on here, but like, do you drink at all? Do you, or a big coffee or tea person? Uh, love coffee. I don't drink it every day. I have a hard time drinking coffee on tour because it'll give me kind of like a little bit of anxiety, it seems like. Yeah. Um, but I love having a cup of coffee during my lessons or maybe if I'm gaming or working on like some video stuff or audio stuff, I, I like to have a glass of coffee. And uh, do you drink or like wine or beer or anything? Yep. I like a lot of Belgian wheat style beers um, and been leaning more towards tequila over whiskey these days with liquor because we've had a lot of whiskey so I'm, my palate's kind of tired of it dude you're, you're sounding like you're kind of mexican over here <laughs> <laughs> tequila and mexican oh my <laughs> dude that's me I, I tequila all the time when it comes to like liquor and then um Nothing like a good old cerveza. Um, okay dude I don't want to take too much of your time up uh this I think uh we got a lot of good information here. I think a lot of people are going to be really stoked to hear about what you're saying in terms of your projects and Vale Amaya and getting to know you a little bit better. Um, before I close out the podcast, is there anything that you would like to plug before we leave? Um, when is this supposed to be coming out? Oh, dude, that's a good question. Because like uh, there's like Christmas coming out and like all these other things. So I might actually postpone this a little bit later on. I'll keep you posted for sure. Yeah, because I don't even know. I know when some things are coming up, but if this is not, I don't know. You're, is it taboo if I don't? No, no. And besides, you were kind of cutting out a little bit there. So whatever. Well, All right. <laughs> yeah, the point is we got Vale and Maya. We got a whole bunch of side projects. Lucas is busy over here. Um, dude, I, I want to thank you again for taking time out of your day to come chat with me. Um, it was awesome to getting to know the vocalists of one of my favorite bands a little bit better. So I appreciate that, man. Of course. And thank you for having me. No worries. But uh, have a good one. You too. Take care. Peace.